Hello, this is Reverend Kay Mortimer with Covenant Truth Ministries, and welcome to you. I am the director of Covenant Truth Ministries and also the director of our exciting debut audio drama, Manger to Majesty, which we are finally ready to present to you now. We are so delighted you are here, and we believe you will enjoy this and be very blessed by it. So now, let me introduce you to one of our main characters, Narrator Mary, and I will see you again at the end, and I'll have a little more information for you then. Hello, I'm Narrator Mary from Covenant Truth Ministries, exciting new audio drama, Manger to Majesty. This original story carries you on a fascinating journey through the pages of Scripture, exploring the life of Jesus Christ through the eyes of the one closest to Him, His Mother. You'll be amazed as you hear what she hears, see what she sees, and feel what she feels. Manger to Majesty's all-volunteer cast and crew has worked tirelessly for months. Some even plan a variety of roles to bring you this compelling story. Join us for this inspiring tale as we see Jesus' story in a brand new way. My pleasure to present to you now, Manger to Majesty. Everyone has a story to tell, but not everyone's has a 4,000 year history. Mine began in a garden a very long time ago. Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Of course, I didn't know my destiny was foretold there. Not until I was in my teens. I knew the story well because my parents, they taught me the Hebrew scriptures from the time I was a little girl. I had heard of Hadassah, Deborah, and others, women in our history chosen for divine destinies. But me, a peasant girl from a small town in Israel, never in my wildest dreams could I have imagined what God had in store. In teaching me the holy scriptures, did my parents know they were preparing me for such a special calling? I was quite young when I met him for the first time. Here, l let me help you with those water pots. I know they are quite heavy. Oh, thank you, kind sir. Yes, they are, but Adonine, our God, help me bring them up from the well. I'm Yosef. And I am Mary. Joseph had come to work on my parents' home. Oh, I thought he was so handsome and strong and honorable. He always treated my parents with the utmost respect. He even treated me with kindness. As a young girl for a man much older than I, to not see me as a child was such a blessing. Never did I ever dream that from one encounter years earlier, I would find myself betrothed to this fine carpenter from Nazareth. A few years later, my father and Joseph signed the contract, which Joseph and I both accepted. Welcome to the family, Joseph of Nazareth. 
My father and Joseph shared a deep embrace before Joseph and I shared the covenant meal. I was married now. Oh, not in the way you might think. Things were much different then, and all according to Jewish custom. It won't be long now, Mary. You will make a lovely bride. Your father and I are so proud of you. Joseph will provide well for you, and you will be very happy. We have great peace about your union with him. He is a most honorable man. Of that, Mother, I'm certain, and I can't wait. It's so hard. Waiting, I mean. I remember my own days of waiting. Waiting and hoping day after day. Ever wondering if today would be the day. Never knowing when my groom would rush in and catch me away. Ugh, oh, but longing for it. I know it's difficult, Mary, but the suspense will end one day soon, and your glorious wedding will come. You'll see. Now, Mary, remember to gather the fresh flowers for the supper table. I have some fruit. Papa will bring fresh nuts and figs. But don't spend too much time out here. I may need your help with other preparations. Yes, Mother. I'll join you shortly. Plans were well underway for our wedding celebration. Joseph had paid the bride price to my father before he left. I couldn't believe how much he gave, valuing me much higher than I ever imagined. Oh, my generous Joseph. And now, I waited, and waited, and waited, never knowing the exact day my man would come for me, yet anticipating it with great joy. Meanwhile, my parents kept me busy, what with the gardening and the baking bread for the town foe, and milking the goat for our daily provisions. I had my own set of chores to do, just as I suppose you do too. Life was normal, or so I thought. Oh, the hillside appears glorious today. The flowers, so radiant and abundant. Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Oh! Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Oh! He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. How can this be, since I'm a virgin? The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your cousin, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. Behold the maidservant of the Lord, let it be according to your word. I can't tell you when it happened or even how it happened. I just know it did. Just like the angel said, just like I knew it would. I danced with explosive joy. I never danced so in my backyard garden before or since for that matter. All was well until... My parents and Joseph, how can I tell them? What will they think? Will they believe me? What if Joseph doesn't believe me? I could die. He could have me stoned. We trust you are blessed by these episodes of Manger to Majesty. Tune in to the next episode to see what happens next. I could die. He could have me stoned.
Oh, God, my father, please help me. The words from the angel that moments earlier had brought ecstatic joy now made me shudder with dread. What was I going to do? Who could I tell? <sighs> Pains of doubt and fear immediately gripped me. I knew they were trying to crush the words I had just heard from the angel. Or had I really heard them after all? Was it all a dream? How could I be sure? Ah, uh, Elizabeth, my cousin, yes, I must go to her. I must see if this is only a dream. She is a wise woman. Surely she will tell me what I should do. I must get to her right away. Talking my parents into that trip was not an easy task. So close to your wedding day, Mary? What about Joseph? What do we tell him if he comes for you? I heard all the questions, but I had no answers. I just knew what I must do. As I looked down to my lap, I knew I didn't have much time. My secret would not stay a secret for long. After much urging, my parents permitted me to travel with close neighbors who were heading for the Judean region as soon as the Feast of Dedication concluded. I kissed Papa and Mama, not knowing what reaction I would find when I returned, but praying for the strength to accept it, whatever it was. After a few days of travel, my companions near the dusty streets where Zacharias and Elizabeth had lived for as long as I could remember. When was it? Yes, the last time I remembered seeing them was in the feast in Jerusalem. Zacharias had been chosen to burn incense. Something strange must have happened, though. I don't know what, but it, he wasn't himself after that. After the long journey, we finally arrived at my cousin's house in Judea. I climbed off the wagon and started up the path to my Elizabeth's home. How would she receive this startling news? Would she believe me? How could she believe me? Would her husband Zacharias have me stoned under the Torah? Oh, God of my fathers, I prayed again. Please help me. Zacharias, could you get the door while I put the bread into the oven out back? Elizabeth? <gasps> oh, Mary, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For as soon as your voice sounded in my ears, the baby leapt for joy in my womb. Oh, thank you, dear cousin. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. Oh, when Elizabeth gently held my cheeks in her hands, and looked intently in my eyes with those confirming words, it felt like the weight of the world lifted from me. That was exactly what I needed to hear. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he who has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant, for behold, henceforth, all generations will call me blessed, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. Blessed is she who believed. Oh, praise God for bringing his promised one. Zacharias prepared a room for me while Elizabeth and I shared fresh fruit together, speaking of God's faithfulness. How did Elizabeth know? Who told her? I had no answers, only peace. After Elizabeth explained Zachariah's own encounter with the angel Gabriel and why he couldn't speak, the two of them reminded me of the scriptures and confirmed what I never would have imagined. Here it is, Zacharias found it from the scroll of Isaiah. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son 
dear Mary, you are that virgin. Me? Elizabeth? Yes, dear one. Zechariah showed me this one also. Look with me. Hear from Moses' writing in the Torah. Back in Genesis, he wrote God's own words spoken in Eden. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. Dear cousin Mary, that woman is you. Me? This was written 4,000 years ago, dear Elizabeth. How could this be speaking of me? Remarkable, isn't it, sweet cousin? You are blessed among all women. What a privilege and honor has been bestowed upon you, my dear. I could hardly believe it. Me, a poor peasant girl from the small town of Nazareth? How could this girl, this young woman, spoken of centuries ago, be me? Yet, in my heart, somehow I knew it was true. The heaviness of my awesome destiny finally lifted from my weary shoulders, if only for that moment in time. At least, someone else knew my secret. Someone who believed it. Someone who affirmed it. Someone who gave me the courage I would desperately need before going home. My time with dear Elizabeth was so brief, it seemed like only a few days, but my slightly bulging tummy told me otherwise. I knew that I must return home soon. Trusted friends of Zacharias had arranged to carry me with them as soon as Passover approached. What's this, dear Elizabeth? I know that I won't be able to see your son and mine grown up, but it is in my heart to honor the Messiah of our people, so I made a little something for him. Oh, Elizabeth, it's beautiful. What a thoughtful gift. I will make sure to wrap him in this soft fleece when he arrives. Thank you so much. Not just for this, but for everything. I so needed this time with you. It has been a joy to have you. Oh, and Zacharias wrote this for you also. Dear Mary, it is my prayer for you and our Messiah that Adonai bless you and keep you. May Adonai make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Adonai lift his countenance upon you and give you all his great peace. Amen. He never tires of the beloved ironic blessing. May God grant it for you and for him, Mary. Thank you, Zacharias. I will cherish this blessing always. The night before I left, we spent praying. I knew Zacharias prayed too even though he couldn't speak yet since his own encounter with Gabriel months ago. Now I knew what had happened to him at the feast. He was going to speak again, soon. Elizabeth was about to burst with her baby and with her joy. Her son, whose name she told me would be John, was somehow especially connected to mine. I hated to leave. <laughs> But Elizabeth's sound words of wisdom and her bastion of strength gave me the faith I needed to return home and face my unknown. I took great comfort in knowing that what was unknown to me was not unknown to my God. Still, I was not prepared for what the next several days would bring.
Mary, I've laid the softest blankets for his bed in this stone manger. He'll be warm and able to rest here now. Thank you, sweet Joseph. Please, give me the blanket from Elizabeth. I'll swaddle him, then wrap him in her blanket. It'll keep him nice and warm tonight. Isn't he wonderful? Yes, he is. More glorious than I ever could have imagined. Just think, Mary. We are the very first to see our promised Messiah, the one our prophets have foretold since Moses. It's amazing and humbling. Yes, it is. Now that he's settled in, 
Why don't you get some rest also, hmm? Huh? Yes, I will. Thank you. watching you run around trying to catch Ella Sheba tonight. She can be one wild you. Just wait, Rachel. She might just make you chase her all over these hills, and I'll laugh my head off when she does. Right now, I'm ready to get some sleep. Okay, you two. Let's rest now that all the sheep have settled down. Rachel, you take the first watch. I'm ready for that, Papa. But Papa, it's Ruth's turn for the first watch. Yes, my daughters, but she's really exhausted. You would be too if you had spent the last hour chasing that sheep all over this hillside. Oh, all right. <gasps> Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is more to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. Wow! Can you believe it? Did we just get an invitation? I think so. Let's go, my children. We have a savior to find. Oh, who could that be traveling with sheep at this time of night? <sighs> shh, Mary, shh, shh. Please, forgive us, kind sir. If you remember, we passed you on the road earlier. I am Eliel, and these are my daughters, Ruth and Rachel. We just witnessed an amazing sight while watching our flocks in the field. Yes, sir. You'll never believe it. We had to come right away. I don't understand. Who do you seek? Him, sir. The Savior we have waited for. The Promised One. Then welcome, dear friends. My wife, Mary, and the Messiah, baby Jesus, are here. Wow. Friends, how'd you find us? The angel led us right here, sweet Mary. The directions were clear. The baby, lying in a manger and wrapped in swaddling clothes. I am sorry, but we still don't understand. Joseph, we are temple shepherds. Our flocks are destined to be offered as Passover lambs. Therefore, we must make sure they conform to rabbinic standards. It's very important that we keep them blameless and ceremonially pure, even from birth. This Migdal Eder is well known to all Bethlehem shepherds. It's kept ceremonially clean because we bring our ewes here to lamb. Once the lambs are born, we wrap them tightly in swaddling clothes and lay them in this stone manger. 
this tower of the flocks dates all the way back to the days of Jacob, when my own namesake, his wife, Rachel, died along this same road to Bethlehem. So you see, the angels gave us these directions we would need to find him. We knew just where to look. Amazing! Our child born in this special place? Maybe that's why we had to stop here, Joseph. After my son's birth, the excess weight of the baby disappeared. Yet the wonders surrounding him had only just begun. The shepherds and their story was merely the beginning of the wonders surrounding my son. Soon after their visit, we went to the temple for Jesus' name day and circumcision. A few weeks later, we brought our turtle doves and the redemption shackles. That's when we got our first hint of what lay ahead. When we arrived at the temple that day, an aged priest stood praying silently, but turned as he heard us climbing the 15 steps at the Nicanor Gate. In a corner of the court of the women, Anna, an elderly widow, watched as the old priest headed our direction. I saw her eyes gleam and excitement burst from her face, although I didn't understand why. Two members of the Sanhedrin, one a famous rabbi in Israel, took note of the two old worshipers and drew close to us also. I knew it. The Lord told me this old servant of his, it would be today. Sir, my name is Simeon. The Lord made me a special promise years ago, and today, it is now fulfilled. May I, may I hold him? Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples. A light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Anna, what is happening with Simeon? Oh, Nicodemus and Joseph of Ramah, he's the one. Messiah is finally here. We pray for the redemption for Israel so long, and he's finally here. He's here. He's finally here. Nicodemus, could it be? Could this really be the redemption that we have longed for since the time of our forefathers? Hmm. Joseph, my friend, is it really possible that he could be the one? Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. A sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. My wife's purification offerings, Rabbi. I have come now to redeem the firstborn son of his mother, as commanded in the Torah. The redemption price has now been received and accepted in place of the child. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us with thy commandments and has commanded us about the ransom of the firstborn son. What an encounter that day in the temple. Neither Joseph nor I knew quite how to take the words of the old man. Little did we know that the best and the worst were yet to come.
The next decade proved quite tumultuous. Magnificent visitors arrived one day, to our utter surprise, when Jesus was a mere toddler. They spoke of a Jew in their country's history, a famous man who served their kings with wisdom and honor and saved their ancestors. They said he had introduced them to the Hebrew scriptures of old. I knew right away who they meant. God had surely used Daniel in powerful ways in that foreign land. Still, their visit to our lowly home was such a shock. The Magi said they had been looking for Daniel's king. They had been watching for the signs and counting the years. They saw his star. They knew he was here. Because of Daniel's prophecy and the words of the Transjordian seer from ancient times, all of which were recorded in our scriptures. They followed his star all the way from the east, bringing elaborate gifts to pay homage to Daniel's new king. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh, gifts we were not able to afford, but would need more than we realized. A few days later, we found out why. Mary, wake up! Hurry! We must go now! Joseph, what's wrong? The angel, Mary. We must go, right away. After the angel's warning, my husband insisted we grab everything we could find in an instant. Thank God for the Magi's gifts. Otherwise, we might not make it to Egypt. But as always, Adonai, our God, took care of every detail. We later learned of the terror inflicted on innocent babes from wicked King Herod that dreadful night. Hearing their screams in the distance caused me to hold my little one tightly as we fled for his life, thanking God for divine protection. I wasn't happy in Egypt at all. I rejoiced when Joseph said Herod was dead and we could go home. Home. The word thrilled me. Back to family, back to our people and our ways, back to our house in Nazareth, the one Joseph had built. Joseph was such a good father. He and I trained young Jesus in the Torah, teaching him from the time he could form sentences to quote the sacred Hebrew scriptures. Joseph used every opportunity daily to quiz Jesus. The task wasn't hard at all because of Jesus' deep passion for his father's words. Now Jesus, our beloved Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord of God, the Lord is one. And the Eshet Chayel, our ode to women. A woman of valor, who can find? She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil in all the days of her life. His bar mitzvah was still a few months away, but we knew he was ready. Three times each year, we loaded up and made the trek to Jerusalem to celebrate God's pilgrimage feast. I'll never forget that one. As a young mother, my greatest fear hit me, and it hit me hard. We were already traveling home. Joseph rode with some of the men, and I with the ladies. I thought Jesus was with Joseph, now that he was 12. Joseph must have thought he rode with me. Imagine our utter horror when we realized Jesus was missing. We had lost the Son of God. After the heart-wrenching trip back to Jerusalem to find our son, Joseph and I were amazed to discover him, surrounded by noted scholars and rabbis, among them Nicodemus and Joseph of Ramah. What would you say is the meaning of this passage from the Torah? 
These are the commandments, the statutes and the judgments, which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, and that you may fear the Lord your God, to keep all of his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, you and your son and your grandson, all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Therefore hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. There is but one God, and besides him there is no other. Loving him with all that is within us, and loving our neighbors as ourselves, means more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices in our law. God, our Heavenly Father, set these commandments before us in order to bless us and to give us a good life here. He desires that we show his love and goodness to others as they see how our God blesses us. It's been God's desire all along that we are all blessed, and it's his desire that we love him from a true and sincere heart, resulting in our obedience to his commandments. Thus, our beloved Shema. <sighs> Joseph of Ramah, how do you think he can know so much? I mean, he has no formal schooling in the Torah as we do. Nicodemus, it is evident that he has studied well, certainly a testament to his parents. They have prepared him well for his bar mitzvah. Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Noted scholars, honored rabbis, I must go now. Thank you for your time. May Adonai bless his people with peace. Shalom. My son's rebuke stung me. I knew he meant it in the right way, but as his mother, it was still hard to hear from my boy. Yet, it reminded me who his father truly was. I realized that day that my boy was now a man, God's man, a man doing his father's work, and I knew I had to release him to his destiny. Joseph passed on the scale of carpentry to Jesus while I was busy raising his siblings. Yes, they had started to come in and we had a house full in just a few short years. We were a lively bunch. At the end of a tiring day, Joseph would tumble around with our brood, rough housing, you might call it. It filled our house with laughter. Oh, there was typical sibling rivalry, especially toward Jesus. But we got through that. A woman full of valor, who can find? She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her and he shall have no lack of gain. My favorite of all were the ancient blessings spoken over the children. Gather, my sons. May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. Come, my daughters. May God make you like Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, who built the house of Israel. See what I mean? How wonderful that our children knew they were blessed by Adonai and were reminded of it every week. A short time later, I suffered the loss of my best friend and faithful husband. As a Jewish woman, along with several children to raise, I knew my future was bleak. But my Jesus, the one I cradled many years earlier, would now care for me and his siblings. As the eldest son, he became the head of our home, working faithfully in Joseph's shop and providing for our every need. Until that dreaded day came. As I prepared our morning breakfast that day, my 30-year-old son entered the room. I knew this day would come, but still, as a mother, it came all too soon. Seeing my son with his packed satchel over his shoulder 
and a rolled up mat under his arm, told me all I needed to know. No, no, son, not yet. Yes, dear mother, it is time. <laughs> I will always love you, you know that. I will always love you, my son. May Adonai go with you everywhere you go. <laughs> Seeing him leave our home that day, embarking on his own, was not easy to take. Even though I still had his brothers and his sisters near me, I would so miss him. It would not be the same, yet it had to be. I learned later of how Jesus' path intertwined with Elizabeth's son at the Jordan River. I so wish I could have seen it. Her son, John the Immerser, they called him, administered this divine mitzvah as a legitimate descendant of Aaron. Yet, John relinquished his right to a priesthood, and God bestowed on Jesus an eternal one, fulfilling David's prophetic words. I wish I could have been there to hear the Father's affirmation, sealing this with his own voice from heaven. Just a short time later, I grieved for Elizabeth when I learned of John's death at the hands of wicked King Herod. Once Jesus left for his ministry work, I didn't get to see him very often. When he was nearby, we would visit. But his work, his father's work, took him all around the land. He rarely stayed in one place for long. I found new delight in our holy days, though, because I knew I would get to see him then. Still, with so many crowding into Jerusalem, we had very little quiet time together. Yet, these remain the highlights of my years. Although I never knew when he'd be close to home again, I always knew he'd be in Jerusalem for the feast three times every year just as the Torah required. <sighs> With each passing year of his ministry, my heart grew more nervous. I saw the sign, and I heard the rumors. I felt the chilling air. Trouble brewed, and the mother in me wanted so desperately to stop it, to shield him, to protect him, to keep him safe safe with me. I regretted that James and the other siblings didn't believe in him as Messiah like I did. I prayed they would believe someday, yet I knew I couldn't count on them for whatever I feared was ahead. Oh, how I prayed for God to intervene and protect him from dangers. I reminded God of the prophecies about him our Messiah, but the heavens seem brass. As Passover drew near, my son James, along with my other children, came with me to Jerusalem to stay with dear friends who always welcomed us. Soon after we arrived, our Passover celebrations were abruptly interrupted by one of Jesus' students, also named John, who is the son of Zebedee. Welcome, Mary, Jane. Here, I'll take your own old bundle and place it with ours until first fruits mourn. Ezra and James can take these to the temple then. Thank you. I'll go check on the others outside and see if they need any help. You'll find Ezra probably in the fields out back, James. He'll be delighted to know that you've arrived. Dear Miriam, thank you for welcoming us. You're always so gracious to care for all of us each year. It's a joy to have you here. I miss Jesus being with you, though. What's it been now? Three years? Yes, three and a half. I fear for him, Miriam. I hear the talk of the town, the leaders. They oppose him. I don't know what they might try to... There, there, Mary. 
Don't let your mind wonder, my dear. We know he is Messiah. God will take care of him. You mustn't worry. <sighs> yes, you are right. I knew opposition continually grew against him. I knew he would be in Jerusalem for this feast. The human mother in me wished he would stay away. But the woman of God in me knew he must come. Still, as Passover grew closer, my concerns for my son intensified. John, what's wrong? Dear Mary, you must hurry. They've taken him. <gasps> Here's your cloak. Hurry, I'll take care of the others. Oh, thank you, dear friend. God go with you, Mary. soldier ripped across my own heart also. I crumbled into John's arms, frozen in fear, withering in pain. This could not be happening. No, this is not how it was supposed to be. by that Roman soldier ripped across my own heart also. I crumbled into John's arms, frozen in fear, withering in pain. This could not be happening. No, this is not how it was supposed to be. How could God intend this? H how could he allow it? It is enough. Untie him. When those cruel Romans released him, he crumpled into the ground. I crawled to him, as close as I could get, mopping up his precious blood with my scar. He was so badly beaten. I could barely stand to look at my own son. He looked like an innocent lamb being led to slaughter. Every inch of his body was now covered with blood. His skin was slashed open everywhere. I tried to clean his precious bloody back with my scarf. Had John not held me tightly, I would have fainted. As a soldier approached, John pulled me away. Get up, you criminal. I felt totally numb, frozen in fear. How could this be God's will? I, I just couldn't accept it. I wouldn't accept it. It made no sense. God, where are you? New spread of Pilate's condemnation of my son to be crucified like a common criminal. John and his mother Salome accompanied me all the way up through the Via Della Rosa, up Golgotha, as we stayed as close to him as we could. Mary of Magdala, one of Jesus' most devoted followers, along with some other women, joined us at the foot of the cross. Ah! 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 No! 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 <laughs> he was so badly bruised and scarred, I barely recognized him. My own son. 
and I barely recognized him. I couldn't even comprehend the torture he endured from those beatings. And the nails, each time I heard the mallet hit those iron spikes, it pierced my own heart. I had to turn away, burying my head in John's shoulder. I wanted to yank Jesus off the cross and cradle him again in my arms. On this hill, my heart cycled through every negative emotion known to mankind. There was the grief, like a gushing fountain, bursting inside my pierced heart. And there was the anger, reddening my cheeks as I watched ruthless Romans torment and mock him without mercy. And there was the fear and the doubt, flooding my mind and heart, spilling from my mouth in whispered prayers. And of course, there was the denial. This could not be part of any redemption plan. Surely, he would jump off that cross at any moment in victory and destroy these evildoers. But he didn't. God, what's happening? Do you not see this? Will you not act? How could you allow my son, your own son, to endure such? Have you abandoned him? Oh, God, why won't you answer me? He did answer, but not then. It was later, much later. And only after things got worse, much worse. This was any mother's worst nightmare. I was helpless, powerless. My son hung on a cross like a common criminal. And for what? Telling people to love each other? Using his hands to heal and bless? What crime had he done? Please, someone tell me, what crime has he done? How dare they? Never in my life had I felt such rage. Never had I sensed true hatred rising within me. How could he endure this? Why did he keep silent? How was I going to live through this? Could I even live through this? More importantly, why? This was our promised Savior, our promised King, Yeshua, Jesus, Messiah. Did he not come to set up his kingdom? Were all of our hopes for deliverance just going to die with him now? Why didn't he do anything to stop this evil? John, how can I watch them slaughter my son? I must call on our God. Adonai, my God, I'm so alone. I've missed Joseph every day since he's been gone, but never as much as today. I need his strong arms to hold me. How can I get through this? Oh God of my fathers. Please don't take Jesus away too. Please, no. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. <laughs> Woman, behold your son. John, Behold your mother. I hate you, Jesus. If, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us too. Do you not fear? God, man, 
We receive the just rewards for our deeds. But this man, he has done nothing wrong. Oh, Lord, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? Kingdom, assuredly. I say to you that today you will be with me in paradise. Bakthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I Thirst. compassion it's his mother and a close friend let them cling to his cross just for a moment please let the women come <laughs> my heart shattered in that moment as the blood and water poured from his side I felt it pouring onto me but I didn't care. That Roman blade had pierced my own heart and soul. As I held my son's legs and wiped them with my scarf, the old man's words from many years earlier rang out in my mind. We should go. Yes, Mary. Come with my son, John, and I. We will take you home with us. Thank God John and his mother, Salome, graciously led me away. Away from the horrors of that cross. Away from the lifeless body that hung there. Away from the son I had cradled in a lowly manger.
So hard to hear you crying, time is standing still. The one she rocked to sleep at night, bleeding on a hill. Forgiveness and sacrifice, she wishes it was her. She feels so helpless, at a loss for words. We don't want to let you go. Nicodemus, I'm glad it fell on us to care for his body and that Adonai favored us before Pilate. Yes, Joseph, but we must hurry to deliver the orders to the Romans before they toss his body into Hinnom with the other criminals. Yes, yes, of course. I have the orders right here. I brought new linens. Do you have the spices? Yes, I'm ready. Good. We will place him in my tomb. It's not far from Naboth. Toss them in Hanam with all the rest. Wait, this one doesn't go to Hanam. Take him down. He goes with these men. You know we have a follower, don't you, Nicodemus? Yes, I saw her. Oh, how she loved him, too. Here, help me spread the linen out here. Of course. There, the last of his anointing. Help me just just a moment so I can lay his talith around him. Can you lift his shoulder slightly? Certainly. Then I'll wrap the sudarian around his head. 
now. Let us wrap him in the linen cloth and then we will pray. Let us wrap him in the linen cloth and then we will pray. Before long, we arrived at John and his mother Salome's home. I remembered very little of the rest of that day. I do remember Mary of Magdalene's embrace before I left the cross. She wouldn't leave him. She couldn't leave him. After all he had done for her, she loved him so much, in life and in death. Dear Mary, rest here while John prepares your room. Thank you for welcoming me, Salome. Even in death, my son provided for me. He was a great son, so much more than I could have ever asked for. He was our promised Messiah. I know it. At least, I thought I did. But how could this horrible end be what his father had in mind? How could the God of our fathers let the Messiah die? I just don't understand. Such questions are impossible for us to answer, my dear. We must trust in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He will right all wrongs. <laughs> There, in Salome's tight embrace, tears gushed from me like a cascading waterfall, propelled by a mighty current in its full force. The high feast days were upon us, with unleavened bread set to begin in just a couple of hours. John made sure I was as comfortable as possible in the Jerusalem home where we stayed for the festival. Salome kept a close eye on me, even though preparations for the meal were well underway. Although I had seen more than these in my lifetime, I never experienced one like this. My son was gone. Our Messiah murdered. The one we waited for, dead. Come here, Mary Magala. Shalom to you. Shalom to you as well, dear Salome. Oh, Mary, I desperately wish I could take away your pain. Our pain. I'd give anything if only I could. Dear sweet Mary, I know that, yet I treasure your concern for him. I wanted to come by to let you know what happened to him after you left the cross. Please do. Two men, both of the Sanhedrin, who were followers of Jesus, although secretly, came with orders from Pilate. I was still clinging to the foot of the cross when they came. Mary, I watched them. I followed them the whole time. Nicodemus and Joseph of Rama gently took Jesus' precious body from that awful cross and carried him to Joseph's own tomb nearby. They wrapped him gently for burial. Then they rolled a stone over the entrance protecting him from predators. Mary, I just had to let you know his body wasn't thrown into Hinnom like common criminals. Your Jesus, our Jesus, is safe. Oh dear Mary, this is such a relief. Thank you, Mary. At least I know my son's precious body rests secure from harm. Well, I must hurry now before the high Sabbath begins. Thank you, Mary for bringing such comforting news. Shalom. Shalom to you as well. Although Mary's sweet hug and comforting words didn't take away my pain, 
they did let this mother know that the body of her precious child rested in peace. For that, I was truthfully grateful. Still, our promised Savior now lay in a cold, dreary tomb, and his mother found herself in the grave of a cold, dreary life. None of this made any sense. Oh, God of our fathers, where are you? There, there, my dear. Go ahead, weep. Let it out, it's all right. <laughs> this holy day was the most solemn I'd ever knew. Sadness loomed over us like a thick cloud, robbing us of the joy that Sabbath of unleavened bread had always brought before. How could I rest on this high Sabbath? Sleep eluded me as I tossed back and forth all night, longing for the break of day, yearning to awaken to the end of this nightmare. This was the most horrible night of my life, even more than losing my Joseph. Losing someone you love is never easy, but losing a child, no matter how old that child is, it's devastating. Morning broke, but brought no relief, no joy. Only a cold, stark reality of yesterday's horror. I knew I was in for another restless day and another restless night. I wondered how many more I must endure. How many more could I endure? Why is the darling of heaven lying there dead in a stone-cold tomb on earth, Gabriel? Angelica, we cannot understand all things. Our wise God knows what he is doing. To be honest, even as an angelic being, Gabriel, it just doesn't make any sense to me either. We certainly never expected this when he left us here. How could the majesty of heaven have let this happen? How could the light of the world be snuffed out? Veronica, we must wait patiently and trust our God on the throne as King of heaven and earth. We will wait, friends, and trust. It had been three days and three of the most torturous nights of my life since my son was murdered. Now, Dawn began to peek through the darkness on this early morning. The start of a new week had always been filled with joy and hope, but not this time. Would it ever be again? <gasps> Look, Angelica, Veronica, he's breathing again. The light is shining again. Yes, Gabriel, I see. There he is, Veronica, rising from the dead. I see it. The champion of heaven slipping right up out of those grave clothes. No stone can stop him. Friends, that's our king. Yes, there's the majesty of heaven. Even death could not hold him in the grave. Gabriel, send Angelica and Veronica to meet me outside this tomb. I'll be there in a moment. Yes, sir, my pleasure. Angelica, roll the stone away. Others are coming. Gladly, Majesty. Now both of you, follow me. I will explain your assignments here. As light replaced more and more of the darkness of the sky, John prepared to carry our first roots over to Temple as a tour required. I had been in John's house paralyzed with grief since my son entrusted my care to him on that fateful day as he hung dying. This feast should be a day of celebration, but not today. Would it ever be again? Unknown to me at the time, sweet Mary of Magdala was on her way to the tomb to anoint Jesus' body. We would soon find out what happened when she arrived. Oh, 
no. No. Please, God, no. Where's the stone? What's happened to my Lord? I don't know what to do. Peter and John, they don't know what to do. I must get to them right away. Before John could carry our unready sample, we heard a knock on the door. Dear Mary, I'm so ashamed. I had wept and wept for days over my unforgivable denial of your son Jesus. How could I have done such a horrible thing to our Lord? Peter, you mustn't condemn yourself. Surely there's forgiveness available for you. Surely, Peter. Remember how he forgave the adulterous woman? She didn't deserve it. And what about Mary of Magdala? What he did for her? Surely God will forgive you too. But John, you didn't deny him. You stuck by him. Me? No. I turned on him. Left him all alone. How could there ever be any forgiveness for me? Within minutes, someone else pounded on the door. Who could that be at this time of morning? <sighs> Peter! John! They have taken away our Lord's body, and I do not know where! And then I are God, no, no, I can't take it anymore. Mary of Magdala, what are you talking about? I went, Peter. While it was still dark, I went to the tomb to anoint him. When I got there, the stone was rolled away. Oh, Peter, I don't know what to do now. I didn't mean to upset you, dear Mary. I didn't know where else to go, but I'm sure he'll be all right. We'll find out as soon as we can. Don't worry, sweet Mary. We'll find out what's happened to your son. We'll return as soon as we know. Peter, let's go. We must make sure he's all right. Thank you, John. I didn't know what else to do. Where's the tomb? Come, I'll show you. Come, Mary, let's pray. He taught us not to fret, but rather to pray. The Lord, Lord is my shepherd, I shall, shall not want. want. He, he makes, makes me to lie down, down in green pastures. pastures. <laughs> he leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. I mean? Hurry up, Peter. Let's go. Hey, wait up. I'm coming. What? What does this mean? What, Peter? What did you see? Oh, yes. Could it be? It has to be. It just has to be. <laughs> Woman, why are you weeping? Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Please, kind sir, if you have carried him away, please tell me where you've laid him, and I will take care of him. Mary. <gasps> oh, teacher. Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, and to my God and your God. Yes, master. Tell them all, including Peter, to meet me. Of course, Rabbi. John returned alone a short time later. His face beamed. 
as he told me what he believed to be a miracle, even though he still had some questions and didn't think Peter was convinced. John didn't know where Jesus was, but he somehow knew Jesus was alive. His words and his face comforted me. But was it too good to be true? John, he's alive. He's really alive. You left the tomb too soon. I saw him. Mary of Magdala, you what? Yes, John, he was there. He spoke to me, called my name. That voice, I'd know that voice anywhere. He said that you and the other disciples, including Peter, are to meet him. Could this be true? Was it possible? The gleam in Mary's eyes told me it must be. I knew her. She had walked with Jesus now for quite some time and was so devoted to him. She was the one who stayed with him at the cross, almost like his keeper, a shomer, my people might say. Still, I could barely believe this news. After the word from Gabriel nearly 34 years ago, prophesying of my own a miracle too, why was my face so small? I knew God could do impossible things. And yet, I was struggling to believe. But somehow, I just knew, though I couldn't explain it. I wanted so much to see him, to touch him. Mary of Magdala said she couldn't touch him. But I hoped that when I saw him, I could. To hug my son again, oh, the thought filled me with excitement. At that moment, though, I would have settled for just seeing him, hearing his wonderful voice, looking into his tender eyes. Explosive joy flooded my soul at the very thought of it. I recall the story John told me. He found Peter, then they rounded up the others, all of them in Peter's house. The doors were all closed, and then, suddenly, there he was. He just appeared, talking with them, comforting them, rebuking them for their lack of faith, encouraging them to believe in him. Then, just as suddenly, he was gone. Hearing their stories only made my longing to see him grow more intense. I soon got my wish. Mother. Oh, Jesus! How I've dreamed of this day! Pure ecstasy engulfed me. I held him. My heart leapt for joy. My son, the savior of the world, now lives again. Jesus' siblings got to see him too, and now they believed in him, finally realizing he's the promised Messiah for our people and for the whole world. All of us became interwoven with the disciples of the Lord's work from then on. Two of my sons, James and Jude, wrote books about him, and God saw fit to include them in the Holy Scriptures. My James also became a great leader in the Jerusalem Church of our Lord. Hmm. The thought stunned me. Our Lord. Then I realized no longer did I see him as my baby. Though I would always be his mother, now he was my Lord. I found the greatest honor of my life by serving him alongside the others. They became like family to us. And they filled in so many holes about my Jesus through their stories about his life. I was able to relive it, at least in my imagination. Feeding 5,000, walking on water, raising the dead and healing the sick. Like Malachi prophesied, Jesus was amazing. After his resurrection, 
I saw him some, but not as much as I would have liked. Next thing I knew, Peter and John told me more news after coming home from the mount. They talked of this awe-inspiring cloud that engulfed him, lifting him up, up and away. They said we were all to tarry to Jerusalem, waiting for what Jesus called the promise of the Father. Shabbat, or Pentecost you might call it, was fast approaching in just ten days. We went to the upper room to focus and pray. Day after day, we prayed and waited as we counted the omer in anticipation, waiting on this next thing Jesus promised. During these few days, I took the opportunity to give special thanks two of the brethren in our midst. Joseph of Rama, Nicodemus, how can I ever thank you for the gentle care you gave to the body of our Lord? You have no idea the degree of comfort you brought me. When Mary of Magdala told of your kindness and boldness to take his precious body and bury it in spite of the cost to you, Thank you, Joseph, for granting your tomb for his burial, and both of you for taking good care of my son. What a precious gift you both gave a grieving mother that fateful weekend. Dearest Mary, it was my highest honor, as he is also my Lord. I, I couldn't have lived with myself had I not cared for him. Yes, Mary, I also knew I had to see to his care, and it was my honor to do so. Pilate was gracious, allowing me the privilege of giving him a proper burial. I wouldn't have had it any other way. He didn't need my grave for long, but it was my honor to share it with him. I'm so thankful you were comforted in your grief. I pray Adonai, our God, will richly bless you both for your service to him. Most of our daylight hours, we fasted and prayed for this special phenomenon Jesus promised to send us. We waited, but we didn't know what for. During that week, Peter rose up like a leader, filling the vacancy left by Judas's demise. Within a short time, the room was filled as 120 people gathered there. Suddenly, all of our waiting ended. We were overtaken by the promise of the Father. What an explosive day it was. So many people drew near to see what was happening. Imagine their confusion, hearing gibberish from the mouths of some, and yet their own dialect from the mouths of others. And Peter, oh my, I don't think I've ever been so proud of Peter as I was on that day. These men are grumpy. They're so grumpy, they're spewing gibberish. And it's only the third hour of the day. Men of Judea, let this be known to you and heed my words. These are not drunk as you suppose, but this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Men of Israel, hear these words. 
Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified, and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Brethren, then what must we do? How may we be saved? Repent. And let every one of you believe on Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is to you, and to your children, and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. See what I mean? A far cry from the man who denied even knowing our Lord. Gone were the days of slicing off an enemy's ear or speaking contrary to Jesus. No, that old Peter was dead and gone. A new Peter had arisen, full of grace, ignited with power, and anointed with the boldness to proclaim the good news about Jesus. Filled with the Holy Spirit, what an effective message he shared. 3,000 souls were saved in that one day alone. I'd say Peter was restored, wouldn't you? From that day forward, his fruitfulness of God's kingdom only grew. Every one of us worked side by side with these previous disciples of Jesus. Now they were no longer students, but apostles, always showing respect and care for everyone in this new church that my son was building. I rejoiced in seeing more and more people who once rejected Jesus now embrace him as their own Lord and Savior. And the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit empowered us to be bold in our witness for Jesus and to have the strength to do our Lord's work. This Holy Spirit transformed prior cowards and the men and women willing to give their very lives for the name of Jesus Christ. Many of them were martyred within a short period of time, including James, the dear brother of John. As had always been in my life, Sabbat again became the highlight of my week, shared now with my new and enlarged family. Praised are you, Adonai our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Praised are you, Adonai our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Over the next months and years, I counted it all an honor to pour into this growing church all the wisdom, love, and help that I could possibly give. May Adonai bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you all and give you his shalom. In the name of Yeshua, amen. A short time later, I was asked about some details that only I would know about my son. A short time later, I was asked about some details that only I would know about my son. Dear Mary, I am Luke and you already know Matthew. We'd like to have a moment to speak with you about a matter, if you don't mind. Certainly Luke, Matthew. 
What's on your mind? Mary, I sense a need to write to Theophilus a thorough account about our Jesus. Even as high government official, he seems to believe but has some question about the veracity of what he has heard about our Lord. I think that would be a great way for you to share our Jesus with him. Perhaps even other people might read your book and learn about him too. I fully support you in this great endeavor. Is there any way I can help you? As a matter of fact, that's why I wanted to speak with you. To give Theophilus a thorough account from the beginning of Jesus' story until he left us. I know of no one no better than you to speak with. Could I ask you about how Jesus' story began? Can you tell me the details about his birth and early life? <laughs> Why, of course, Luke. I'd be delighted. Every mother I've ever known could give you all details about their baby's birth. But his story doesn't really begin with me. I don't understand. Let me begin at the beginning. You see, it all started with my relative, Zacharias. Let me tell you about him. He was a man who lived in the hill country of Judah with his wife, Elizabeth. Not just any man, mind you. He was a priest. As a matter of fact, both he and Elizabeth were descended from Aaron's line. When he served in the course of Abijah, one unforgettable day, he was chosen for the once-in-a-lifetime intense burning service. As he was inside the holy place, the most awesome and incredible thing happened. I told him how Zacharias and Elizabeth's story intermingled with mine. I recounted my own visit with the angel, my journey to see my cousins, and my encounter with Joseph upon my return home. I'm so grateful for Elizabeth. I surely needed her wise words when I returned and met Joseph again. Mary, could you tell me about that? Sure, Matthew. You see, I had been gone about three months. And Joseph was not happy at all when I returned and he saw me pregnant. I wasn't able to persuade him with the truth about Jesus, what God did. How so, dear Mary? I told him about the angel coming to Joseph to confirm the truth I already knew. I shared how Jesus was born in a manger, exactly like the angel told the nearby temple shepherds who came to worship him that night. I shared about the surprise visit of the Magi of the East and our narrow escape to Egypt, as well as our joyful return home. I applauded Jesus' early knowledge of the Holy Scriptures and how he amazed temple leaders in Jerusalem the year we lost the Son of God. The next several years brought tremendous growth as many more people came to know Jesus as their own Lord and Savior. We welcomed them all, each and every one. I have to admit it though, we had some definite questions about one. He had a reputation for being a Christ hater, even persecuting the church and approving of Stephen's murder. But soon, our fears were relieved as we learned his story. Paul became quite a servant of my son, writing lots of books and suffering much for Jesus' sake. What a powerful testimony that God would even forgive and save a murderer. Over time, we all helped each other learn the whole story of my son, Jesus, the man who changed all our lives forever. God used it magnificently, too. 
He saw fit to preserve it in his special book of the scriptures for you to read. That way, you will also know the truth in your day, just as we did in ours. The truth of a loving God, willing to give his own son so that you and I could have a relationship with him. I can just imagine what kept Jesus going to Golgotha that fateful day. Seeing our faces, yours and mine, the faces of James, John, Peter, Mary of Magdala, your face too, and all the millions born since that time, each one. You see, we are all the ones for whom he willingly died. The years passed as I abode with John in Ephesus, where we served the church there. My dear friend, Mary of Magdala, stayed with me there. My soul and spirit prospered, but my body grew weaker. I knew the day was coming for my passing, and soon. I would join others who had gone before me, Elizabeth, Zacharias, their son John, my parents, Salome, and my dear Joseph. I longed for that day when I would see them all again. But more than that, I dreamed of seeing my son. <sighs> oh, John, the best part is I'll see my son never to be separated again. And my beloved Joseph and Papa, and Mama, and sweet Salome, and James. What a joy to be reunited with all of them. John, Mary, I can't thank you both enough for your tender care of me all these years. Since Jesus. <laughs> no need of thanks, dearest Mary. It has been our honor to receive you as our mother. The whole church has felt that way. What a blessing you are to all of us. Tis true, sweet Mary. John and Mary, they knew I was waning, although they never said anything. As my day drew near, I knew I had no need to fear death. But still, I didn't know what to expect. Oh, oh John, there he is. I see him. He's so glorious, his face shine as bright as the seven suns. Oh, can you see him? He's so beautiful, majestic, and glorious is he. Oh Mary, I wish I could see him as you do right now. Angelica, it's time. Bring her to me. Gladly, Majesty. Mary, look, he's standing up, he's sending an angel, oh John, he's calling for me, tell the others John and Mary, promise me, you'll tell them how glorious he is, in his majesty, tell them all, oh Mary, this is a place of great beauty, my son, my lord, our Lord is glorious. His face, I see it. He's coming, John. He's coming for me. Tell the others how glorious.
I was astonished by the splendor of my son and his glorious majesty. He was so much more beautiful than I ever could have dreamed. And this place, oh, the glories I saw, beauty beyond any description. I could hardly believe my eyes. He came running for me, and I ran to him. He flung me around over and over as we cried and laughed together. My heart was so full, I could hardly contain myself. When he finally set me down again, I had to bow and kiss his beautiful scarred feet until he raised me up, that is. Come, dear mother, I'm thrilled to present you to the Father in heaven. And there's a few more that want to see you, too. Joseph, Mother, Papa, Elizabeth, Zacharias, Salome, James. What a reunion, and what a sight. My son, from a lowly manger, now exalted to the highest throne in the universe. Soon after, Mary of Magdala joined us, with John the Apostle coming a few years later. I've watched Jesus give this same welcome to every believer countless number of times over the past 2,000 years. He receives each and every one of his children with the same joy and with the two words that we all live to hear him say, Well done. I ask you, will you join us there? Will you hear these words greeting you? We all did, and you can too. I'll be waiting for you, friend. Once I kissed you as my babe Now I see you clothed in majesty Once I lay you in a bed of stone Now you sit on the highest throne Oh, I called you my precious son now I worship you, the Holy One. Once I lay you in a dark, cold tomb, now you light our heavenly home to see. Thank you. 
My name is Kay Mortimer, Director of Covenant Truth Ministries and Manger to Majesty. We trust that you have thoroughly enjoyed this drama and that God has richly blessed you through the message of Jesus Christ we shared. We hope you will listen time and again and that you will share this story with others. We'd love to hear from you, especially if you have been touched by this project. Please leave us your comments or contact us by email at info at mangertomajesty.com. I'd also like to let you know that the novel, Manger to Majesty, is available in print or ebook forms for you to enjoy as well as we dive a bit deeper into Mary's beautiful story. I want to take this opportunity also to thank everyone who worked so faithfully on this project, especially our all-volunteer cast and crew, many doing multiple jobs and playing a variety of roles. For more information about our ministry or to consider partnering with us through a generous donation to help fund future projects, please visit CovenantTruthMinistries.com. We pray the Lord Jesus Christ draws you into a deeper relationship with Him as we all await the glorious day when we are reunited with our Lord and Savior. Now may God the Father bless you and keep you. May He make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May He lift up His countenance upon you and give you His shalom. In the name of Yeshua Jesus, amen.